The following session was recorded live in San Antonio, Texas for the 2003 Caller Lab Conference. This is tape number 26, How to Get Party Night. I'd like to welcome you to the session this afternoon on How to Get a Party Night. My name is Greg Anderson from Colorado Springs. I'm the moderator for this session. And as moderator, I'm entitled to moderate only and not be a panelist. And I have an excellent panelist for you today. Otto Waterman from Trinity, Texas, is not only very successful in doing party nights and acquiring them, but Otto, by profession, is a trained as a salesman, and that's the way he has made much of his living. So as a professional salesman, he's going to have lots of insights for you. Realizing that earlier on and knowing that Otto would far outclass me, although I might be able to offer some pointers here and there, Otto was going to outclass me, so I prepared a very simple handout. In fact, it's so simple I'm not even going to hand it out. It has in uh, about 42-point uh, font the very important message on there, pay very close attention to what Otto says. That's my handout. Otto, if you take it over, please. He's tough, i tell you. Uh... I'm going to use three words, and I, if you have a pen and pencil, I'd like for you to write them down. It applies to everything that you do. Everything. The first word is competence. C-O-M-P-E-T-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Competence. The second word is confidence. And the third word is enthusiasm. Nothing in life happens without some kind of competence. In other words, when you go out there to call a square dance, you have to have some ability. And that ability gives you confidence for doing your dance. And with that confidence, you generate enthusiasm. Likewise, the recipient of your dance, the dancer, if you work them enough, drill them enough in the moves, they become competent, they have confidence, and they will show enthusiasm. All right. The reason I'm using these three words is because, number one, to sell anything, you've got to do your homework. And I have a handout. It starts off with, uh, I would like to tell you that I, I could announce to the world that there is one way of selling square dancing, one way of selling one night stands, but there are a lot of ways of doing it. Uh, I did a uh, presentation to Caller Lab two years ago on target marketing. I want to use a couple of the things. If you have no contacts to the outside world, in other words, outside of square dancing, if you don't belong to a church, if you don't belong to a service organization, you don't have children in the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, you're not involved with Lions Clubs or Veterans of Foreign Wars, any of these type things. You're not in any com community uh, groups. Then you don't have contacts. So what you've got to do is you've got to find out who would be the recipient of what I have to offer. But you have got to decide first what you want to do. You have to have a goal. Do I want to be, do I want to do one night stands? Do I want to do the community dance program? How far do I want to go? There are some that are just thrilled to death, have a great time doing contras. I do very simple contras. Last night there was no way that I was going to get up and do a contra because the contras that I do are for non-dancers. And it would be like elementary education to the people that were in the hall. I had nothing to offer. But they had a lot to offer me. So my goal last night was to absorb as much as I could, watch and see what I could get. So your goal in selling square dancing and what you want to do ha has to be decided by you. Who do you want to sell to? What group of people are you more interested in seniors, people that have health problems? Are you interested in kids? By doing that, you decide what kind of program you're going to have. You have to have the correct records for what you're wanting to do. Greg and I both call to the vast majority our teens. 
and young adults, college students. But we also do adults. We change our program. So if you're going to sell this program and you're going to sell it to a church, you have got to do some homework ahead of time, most especially if you're not connected. And to me, the best way to get connected is someone in the club that you're calling for has got to be connected. So you've got to use all, all your assets. It's, it's the, the word I, that everybody has been talking about for 25 years. And for those that, that are listening to this on tape, I just swung my arm around. I'm very active in what I do. It's you network. Every dance you call, you call it as the last dance you will ever call in your life. Call it as best as you can. And if you do a one-nighter for your club, I had to go over to a church, remember that everyone in that hall, except the people that hired you, are potential clients. That in that room, there's doctors, there's lawyers, there's school teachers, there's bankers, there's truck drivers, there's human resource directors, there's every kind of person in the world. There's every kind of education level. So in your desire to do one-nighters or dance parties, you have to decide what level you're going to be at. And if you don't have those contacts, I'm going to give you a couple of areas you need to look at. Number one, in every la large metropolitan center you and small places, you have libraries. Within the library, you have a Coles directory, you have the Dun & Bradstreet directory, and you have other corporate directories. It lists the assets of the company, the amount of employees, their corporate headquarters, and the amount of money they make. What am I going to do with that? In every major corporation, there's a human resources director. Underneath the human resources director, there's a wellness coordinator. There's an employee committee coordinator. Within the marketing department, within the financial department, there are people because you want to be all-inclusive within a company. You start getting all the names. You call the company, and you get the information of who to contact. But when you get ready to make that contact, you sit down and you write every word that you're going to say. Even before, when you call and ask for the name of the person that you're going to uh, ask for, you pre-script how you're going to do it. And the reason is, you have to come over as a professional. You cannot come over as someone that has really no purpose. I always think of a receptionist, whether they're uh, the church secretary or their corporate sec uh, secretary, they're the guards to the castle. And with their sword, they can slay you before you ever get to the gate. And that's their job to slay you. And that sucker went to sleep. <laughs> I'm talking about my, my computer. I have notes in there. And uh, it went into screensaver. I'm glad you clarified that. All the people on the tape might think it's been the moderator went to sleep. <laughs> and uh, so uh, you have to, when you make that phone call to get that information, you have got to sound like a professional. Then when you get all that information together, you prepare a letter. And this letter must be concise. People in business don't have time. Churches don't have time. And your letter has to be aimed at, the, with, uh, let me get, use the correct word. If it's the wellness, it has to be worded so that you're talking about exercise and the benefits of exercise in square dancing. And I would like to set up an appointment with you to discuss the, uh, your exercise. You don't say square dancing in it. We have a motor skills development program that could be beneficial to your company and its employees. You word it like, we have maintenance engineers, used to be called janitors. You word it so that it sells, okay? 
Greg the other day talked about we have a cleansing bar, not soap, in the rooms. Wasn't it? Clarifying bar. That's clarifying what they call it. We don't bar. even have soap anymore. Yeah, we have clarifying bars. Yeah. <laughs> so it has to work. Now, if you're trying to sell to a minister in a church, you have to know what's driving that minister. Is it to get the gospel across? Or is it to bring new people into the church? So if it's to bring, in most and almost always, it's to maintain what they have and to get new people. So when you approach them and you send this letter, it has to bring forth the point that you can help in his uh, goal of bringing more people to Christ or whatever. All right? Now... I think it's still live. You're not hearing it? Yes. Okay. I'll get down here and talk. All right? If, uh, I can always use the other mic. Because every church has, a, yeah, there is. Yeah, it's in there. They just didn't pop the lid down. Yeah. Every one of them has a different goal. I do church camps, a lot of church camps. And the goal in the church camps are to bring the non-church members within the camp. To, uh, to bring them and uh, it's to help in the ministry of bringing the kids into the church. And square dancing is a very integral part of that because they, they arrive at this camp they don't know anyone, they're not associated with anyone, and they're like loners. So within the first evening, they become a part of a gigantic group. And so when I do my, my dances, the first thing out of the hat, we're changing partners. We're saying howdy to everybody. So when, you, when I approach a minister, I'm talking to the minister about the benefits of square dancing and his ministry of reaching out to the non-believing public. That's what you have to have in your letter. How can I help you? It's not what he can do for you. You have to, you have to satisfy his needs and his goals. You also, after you send the letter, must call him within three days. Three days. To set the appointment. In the letter, you, you say, I'm going to be calling you in a few days to set an appointment. You call them. If you can't get the appointment and they didn't return the call, within five more days, you're calling them again. In selling, I made 30 phone calls a day to get appointments. And out of 30 phone calls a day, I got four appointments. And this was every day, every day, every day. And we as Square Dance callers have been real sort of lazy. The dancers show up to dance. I don't have a problem. I'm going to call. This, this, the world's changed. We've lost those dancers. And now we need to market for ourselves. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to know, learn marketing tool, uh, marketing skills, and you've got to be able to reach out and get to those people. And you've got to be skilled at it. You've got to sound like what, what you, uh, you know what you're doing. I also do something else. I asked a minister for a letter of reference after a successful dance. If you don't do that, you're not going to get it. I have a minister that was in Houston. He was in Houston for 17 years as a minister of Houston First Baptist Church. He was well respected in the Southern Baptist community. He ended up in Fort Worth. He didn't even park at the house and the phone call came for me to go to Fort Worth. He had so many peers under him. It's just like, let's say in New England, who was the big caller in New England? Uh, 30 years ago. You okay? Say, I, I'm not from New England. I don't know those people. 
But in our area, we had Melton Luttrells, the Ray Smiths, the Harper Smiths. Well, there were a lot of protégés under them. That's your contacts. That's how uh, I get all my phone calls. I'm terrible at marketing. I'm standing up here talking to you about marketing, but I market during the dance because there are people in that room that are helping with the church activities that are school teachers, business people. That room is filled with sponsors that have clout outside the church. And every time you call, you have at least a dozen contacts that are there. I, uh, I have supplied records. School teachers here, hey, I like that tune. What are you doing? Where can I get it? Give me your card. I email them. I have record companies sending them records. I've bought records to have them sent to them so that the school now is hiring me. Okay? You have to use your contacts. It's, it's, it's called networking. I don't think that either one of us really do any advertising, do we? I'm not on a web page. I'm not in the yellow pages. But I have ministers that are absolutely thrilled. We have kids that have left church, gone to other churches, and told the minister, call Houston's First Baptist or Travis Avenue Baptist in Fort Worth, find out where Otto and Hot Rod are at and how to get in touch with them. And they know. I still have a cell phone that has a Houston phone number. And I don't live near Houston. Well, I live 100 miles from Houston. I could care less about AOL if they went to $50 a month I am going to be waterman at AOL.com because I am not going to change my email address. So that's part of, hold on to what you got. If you see that, hey, I've got a better deal at $13 someplace, uh-uh, you just, you just cut your life cord because you left cards all along the way at all these dances that you did that had the other email address. I was trying to tell them uh, Saturday that we have been booked for a dance because of a dance I called eight years ago. I gave someone a card eight years ago, and they hung on to it. So you've got to keep your addresses and your phone numbers, even if it costs you money. But going back to the marketing aspect, you have got to be professional in the way you handle yourself in getting your appointments. I'm putting together right now a six and a half minute video. I've got it scripted. I have all the footage. I have the footage already logged, have my cuts and everything. And we get back. Uh, I'll work on that. And I will also work on my presentations for the summer. There was a lot of material this week and weekend that I can use in my one-nighters. If I don't get that material organized, I can't sell myself. Okay, so I put that together. You've got certain goals so that you can market yourself. And so I'm doing those two things because I'm going to do the conference for Southern Baptist youth camps and all the youth directors in February. And I will tell you, I'm going to have 200 tapes with our cards for all these youth camps of what we do. That's, that's my marketing. And my, my goal is to be at the Southern Baptist Convention as the entertainer calling square dances. That's my goal. And I'm not Baptist. I'm a Lutheran. Okay? So everyone has their own goals and, and, the, and the direction they want to go. I don't want to do the community dance program. I want to do youth groups, single adults, uh, adult Bible, uh, Bible study groups and colleges. How many of you call for a college? For the tape, purpose of the tape, we've got about four hands. Have any of you contacted the Baptist Student Ministries at the colleges? One hand. You know how many attend Baptist church service at Texas A&M? in Bryan, Texas, on Wednesday nights? 
seven and a half thousand. Seven and a half thousand Baptist students at Texas A&M. You know how the, how the BSM at LSU sells? We talk about marketing. How they sell their group to the non-Baptists. They hire Hot Rod and I to come to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We put on a dance. They charge five dollars. The dance has hamburgers, and hot dogs, a hayride, two soft drinks. That's for the Baptist Student Ministries. All the non-Baptists get in free. Okay? It's called marketing. There is not a college student in the world that wouldn't go get a free meal. So they join in. And the next thing you know, the next week, these kids are in the Baptist Student Ministry. It's called selling, marketing. The same thing happened at University of Texas in Austin. We called for the Chinese Baptist... Uh, now, it wasn't Chinese Baptist. It was a Chinese Christian Bible study group. And they didn't charge for any guest. They charged for themselves. First time we went over there, we had 160 kids. Next time we went over there, we had 450. The place just filled up. You couldn't, it's, it's marketing. So when you think about your assets, what you have, you have to look at where you want to go with it. And if you're going to look at where you're going to go with it, you've got to look in your record case. Because kids don't listen to 1950s and 1960 contra music. I am sorry. That is not what they listen to. We can play that for ourselves. We can do it in contra, uh, contra lab and all, but it's not what they're going to hear. They want really upbeat music. So when you market yourself, you have to change a lot of things. You have to make an investment. I, in the handout that I have, I talk about the national callers, the traveling callers. All of us make an investment. We make an investment in time. And if you're going to market outside the activity, you have got to make an investment of time, both in research, an investment in, uh, in financial, because you've got to pay for postage and you've got to do all the things you, and you might have to take off your job to go out there and call on these people you have got to make some sales calls Otto let me interject a, a thought here that you're, you're talking about there, we're really talking today about how to get a party the first time and then how to get a party the second time mm -hmm. there, there are two, two parts of a whole and this how to get a party the second time that Otto's talking about now when you talk about your investment in equipment and music we've got a generation now especially when you're talking about the younger folk who have grown up going to movie theaters with THX stereo sound fabulous sound systems in these movie theaters and if you go into an arrangement where you're doing a party for that kind of audience and you've got scratchy records you're dead in the water. You got the dance the first time, obviously, but maybe you won't get the dance the second time. I had a DJ friend in Colorado Springs who, during one of our conversations years ago, we were talking about uh, equipment and, and such, and he said, well, the equipment's not really the expensive part. The expensive part is the music. And he spends hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars uh, on the music. If I have an opportunity to, even with my square dance clubs, if I'm going to buy a pop tune to use for a round dance, I will not spend the three, four, five, six dollars on the 45 RPM. If it's available on CD, I'll get the CD. Yes, I will try to go to the CD, uh, used CD store to try to find it in an eight or nine dollar version instead of a 15 or 16 dollar version. But I want the best quality of music that I can have. And I want the best equipment that I can afford for doing those parties. Those kinds of attentions to detail on the quality of your music and the quality of your equipment, besides a whole lot of other factors, will help ensure you getting the party night the second time and the third time and the fourth time. The, um, the thing about kids, they're, they're real enthusiastic. I was asked yesterday whether or not I changed anything in my presentation when they got real loud. 
Nope, I just got louder. Really. Because I think, like everything in life, enthusiasm builds enthusiasm. And what I'm trying to do is make them successful. And if they're successful, they will leave there in word of mouth. And in my handout, I'm talking about word of mouth. If you did a successful one-nighter, it will travel. We talk about, uh, I was talking about the traveling professional caller. He paid his dues by going to nationals and states and volunteering, paying his own way doing all the things that he had to do to get out in front of the square dancing public. Well, you've got to do essentially the same thing in the non-square dancing public. You've got to do some free ones. And I mentioned in the handout that we're going to give to you that when you do an exhibition with your club and it's 30 minutes long and you get people up and they had a good time that was your marketing tool. The second time they call and they want you to do two hours, now is the time you're not going to take your club. Now is the time you're going to sell. Okay? And each time you do that, there are people in that room that are potential as employers, people that can hire you. And there's nothing greater than finding one person in a group that has a lot of contacts. And I had one minister that has trained all these ministers, and they're all coming to me. Yes. Uh, tell us your name and where you're from. Fred Bouvier from uh, New Orleans. Uh, during your one-night stand, do you make some sort of a pitch to bring to their mind that they can hire you for another function later? I never sell. I don't put out a business card. I never sell. I don't know. Do you? There's an exception to that that I do it, and I don't know if it's, it's right or wrong. We obviously all have different opinions about how we do things, but for the past 25 years, in the summertime, I've done Western dance parties up at uh, Lodge and uh, about 100 miles west of Colorado Springs where we get families to come spend the week, and, and the Thursday night function is an outdoor barbecue dinner followed by a dance and this includes uh, kids, teens, adults and in that environment uh, because we do get people from all over the United States and therefore they're not from the local area I do say later on in the evening if any of y'all would like to have a party like this in your neck of the woods come get one of my cards before you leave tonight uh, maybe two or three couples get a card and out of 12 weeks of the summer, that's maybe three dozen cards I've handed out. Uh, do I get three dozen calls the next year? No. Do I get three calls the next year? Probably not. But it has, by doing that, and maybe it would have happened whether I had made the pitch or not, but because of that, I have had the opportunity to go do wedding receptions in Oregon and California and Georgia. I've uh, been in Memphis to do parties. I've done a, a corporate party in Arizona. I've done... Uh, a church uh, school fundraiser in Jackson, Mississippi, and all of those is an outgrowth of those contacts made there. Whether, again, whether or not those would have happened had I not made a direct pitch, I have no way of knowing. But in my case, it's, it's something that I do. Uh, another thing that is in some ways overt advertising, but I use this on a very limited, limited basis, I've got a bunch of photo cards, and you can see a sample after the session is over with, this is nothing more than one of those, it's like the sports trading cards. In fact, I went to a company in California, I believe it was in Los Angeles, that does uh, sport trading cards. And I had a professional photograph taken in Colorado Springs, and I sent that color photograph off. And, and between me and the people at the trading card company, we had a card design. It's got my picture on the front and my name. And then on the back, it has information on how to contact me and what kind of parties I do. We have high school and college kids on the summer staff at these lodges and they're there for a month at a time so we have three different staffs of about 50 high school and college kids I make sure that each one of those kids who came to that camp to work for no charge for free I make sure they get an autographed picture card from me uh, before they leave 
it rarely creates any business, but it's certainly something that brings some joy to them, and I end up with an instant fan club, and it's just kind of fun and neat. But yes, I've gotten a couple wedding receptions in later years out of those things, too. So again, it, the, the investment in those cards, I mean, they're not cheap. They're, at the time, they were about eight cents each, and you order 4,000 of them, and the cost adds up, plus the cost of the photograph and such. But to me, it, it's kind of a fun thing that adds on to it. But I guess the bottom line is it's a form of advertising that I use, but whether it pays dividends is anyone's guess. I have my cards at, our, at my PA set. I also have a card that's bigger. It's a postcard size, and it says on there, Entertainer for Christian Camps. Entertainers for Christian Camps. And that's the heading on it, Otto and Nora Waterman, Square Dance Callers. And somebody said, well, does Nora call? She doesn't. But she is as much or more of the team than I am. They know her name. They don't know my name. The ministers call the house Hot Rod. They don't know her by Nora. It's Hot Rod. So we have the cards there. It's, uh, I'm... I'm terrible about marketing. I'm standing up here and I'm talking about marketing, but I'm a very shy person. I know you can't believe that. But I have a difficult time selling myself. I can sell the activity, but I have a difficult time selling myself. And it sounds like it, I can sell what we do, but I, I have a difficult time selling me. And you, and, and Garland will tell you. I told him, uh, Garland Smith from, from Houston, he called me a couple of months ago and wanted to know about some records and what I did. And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to go to San Antonio and find out. And so here he is. But I sold him on the idea, and you learned a lot, didn't you? And for those of you listening to the tape, you've got to come to San Antonio or you've got to come to the next Color Lab convention because it's very instructional. We, we learn a lot, and that's part of your library that you're putting back, your investment, so that you can reach those goals of who you're trying to, to, to contact. I, uh, we were going to have someone come in. Uh, we don't want to talk about lucrative, but there's a lot of things that we do that pay real well. I don't know that I have quoted anyone a price recently or in, at any time recently. It's gotten to the point that they know. If you think, see, years ago I called on an industry, I called on the floral industry as a corrugated box salesman and paper salesman. I found out years ago that no matter whether or not they were in competition, they spoke to each other. They were in associations. So when I quote a church or a church pays me because the first dance I ever did, I never asked for pay. They gave me a check. It was substantial. I loved it. Okay? The next church that called was told by that church who to call. And they said back and forth, I am sure, why do you pay him? And they was told. So when I got my check from that church, it was identical. I still haven't quoted the church. So when I made my first trip to Oklahoma, he counted up the miles and the time. And it was double substantial. And we go to Oklahoma a bunch now. And all the churches know because they all communicate. They're all, we, we, back to networking. Where do you get the material you want for this ministry and the subject we're going to talk about? Well, we got it over here. The ministers network on everything, on how to, how to do the gospel as well as who to hire. And we were in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, calling a dance for a church out of Baton Rouge. And here's a guy from Houston. And he says, where are you going to be tomorrow night? I said, we're going to be in Leakey, Texas. He says, I'll see you. We were working the circuit. It was, I was just like a circuit rider. I mean, the bands are moving between camps. The ministers are moving between camps. And Otto and Nora are moving between camps. We look up, we got the same minister here. 
A week later, we're 500 miles away, and there he is. Because if it's working for the church, they don't change. So, uh, going back to this marketing, you've got to set who you're going to call for and get your record case to sell square dancing and yourself to that age group. Uh, tonight, we were talking, trying to plan how we're going to work because Greg and I call two different type programs. We're both successful, but I do things in threes and he does things in ones. He starts off with Grand March. I don't ever use a Grand March. I use a, a Serpentine for, for kids, sometimes with adults. But we're so different, we had to discuss it. Well, another thing we got a problem with is we have an older group here. My stuff it hooks it, baby. I'm telling you, it gets it on. And you can't hardly slow down a CD. So when we start doing some of the stuff tonight, we're not going to do it all the way through. Because I am not about to do any mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to anybody. <laughs> That's all there is to it. I haven't had anybody die on me, and I'm not going to tonight. For y'all on the tape that didn't understand that southern accent, he was saying mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Garland has got to call a dance tonight in Houston. And so we knew that he was leaving. Do you have any questions for us? Helen McConnell. Helen McConnell from North Carolina. Um, once you set up the date and the time and the place and everything, do you send a written confirmation letter or do a contract or do they want a contract? Or that, that certainly for me varies, but more of the groups lately, especially if it's the first time I've done business with them, would like a contract. And for me, the contract is very simple. It's just a, a short three-paragraph letter where I provide a place at the bottom for me to sign and date it and for them to sign and date it. And I send two copies along with a stamp return envelope to them, and, and uh, they sign one and send it back. There's also many times where they ask if a deposit uh, is required, and I'll tell them the amount of the deposit. And... Uh, in, stipulate that in the contract as well. All right, with me it's totally different. Unless it is a booking agent. And a booking agent requires a contract. And now we're talking about a corporate event. And corporate events and church events are totally different. Most of my correspondence nowadays has been email. We will make uh, voice contact and they will get everything settled as to what we're going to do and what time I start and where we're going to be and how many are anticipated there and the fee arrangement but there's absolutely no contract I, I called a dance uh, three weeks ago for a church I saw that the minister was really busy we left I did not hang around for the check I won't hang around for the check and then here comes this apologetic letter. I am so sorry that I didn't give you that check. I hope this has not been an inconvenience. And, but I don't worry about the check. It will be there. And then I've called a dance where I'm there an hour and a half early and the check is in my hand when I walk in the door. It's, I don't worry about the check with the churches and most organizations. I do worry about the check when it's a service organization such as the National Teachers Association of, and, of uh, magnet schools, administrators for magnet schools or something like that. I waited 90 days. And if you don't get that money up front, you might not get it. So, uh, but within our conversation, I'm going to find out whether or not, like, I've got to get back with people in Florida, or they're in Houston, but they're going to be traveling to Florida. I don't want to have to haul all my sound equipment to Florida. I don't need to carry speakers when they have huge speakers of their own. But I do want to carry my amp and, and such things like that, so we get those things ironed out as to what has to be carried, what the length of run I have to have for extension cords. All these things are in, in some context of email. 
And if they have an oddball address that I can't download from the internet, I want specific directions on how to get there from the highway. Because I am telling you, I have been places where it's the road that has four mailboxes on the left with a red one in the middle, out in the country. And that's where we went. We went to an Amish barn, and I can get there blindfolded now. But the first time I went there, I went up and down that dumb road for an hour trying to find those four lousy mailboxes, and there was wild pigs running across it and everything else. So you've got to have directions on where you're going. But I never worry about the fee. The fee will be there. Did I see a hand up in the back? Still have a question? Otto, Otto, would you... Got a question there anywhere? Otto, would you address the area? You mentioned booking agents. Would you talk a little bit more about that, please? When I was in Houston, starting in about 1970, there was a... Blue Star Records was owned by Norman and Nadine Murbach. And there was a caller by the name of Red Donaghy. And between the two of them, they ended up, because of Murbach Record Service and the Yellow Pages, they had contacts with booking agents. And I learned a lot from them as a young caller in that if I got my name in front of a booking agent and I did a good job, the booking agent would book me again. So I sent pictures and letters to booking agents. I haven't done it recently. We, know, we, we don't get any booking agent things now. The last big one we did was Omni Hotels. Omni Hotels, any of the hotels, any corporation will do conferences where they bring people in from all over the world. Compact Computer Company, I guess, was the last one. They brought the marketing directors for all the continents into one meeting for one specific computer for corporate businesses to train these people. The night before their training started, we were the icebreaker, and it was booked by a booking agent. And it was a booking agent that we had booked through for years. And they essentially knew my fee, and they also know what their percentage is. And I'm going to tell you, folks, they don't want to make $25. They don't want to make $100. They want 25% of what you're going to make, and they want that 25% to be $250. They don't want to do something for free. And there's where your contract gets involved, because they're not going to do it without a contract. They're not going to do it without upfront money. And uh, Omni Hotels booked this, what, four times in one year. It was all the marketing directors for all the hotels worldwide, all came to Houston. It was all hotel managers worldwide. Then it was all the maintenance engineers worldwide. And then it, it was all the front desk people. I don't know what they were doing in all those front desks everywhere, but it was all the key people for Omni Hotels came to Houston because we had an Omni Hotel there. And Houston, like Denver, is a place that is country western. We, have a, we had mayors that tried to deny the fact that we were western. But we are an oil city, we're a computer city, we're a space city, but every time a convention comes to town, they're going to get barbecue. Barbecue and beans and jalapenos. And they're going to go out to a ranch. And so that's part of it. So they have a country western band, they're going to have a square dance caller. And I'm telling you, there's some of those events, I call for 20 minutes for that fee. It took me longer to unpack my equipment out of the trunk than it did for me to call. But you can get in contact with the marketing, with the, the, the booking agents. But before you do, in this day and age, I think you need to take them a, a CD with two minutes of video on it or a videotape that only has about three minutes. I was in the video, uh, in the, in the video business. I, was a, I sold videos as marketing tools and as training tools. I've had several lives. Time for a tape change. This type of meeting could be very boring. A video that's eight minutes long is death. 
a video that doesn't change scenes. I'm going to give you a hint if you're planning on doing a video. If it does not change scenes every eight seconds, every eight seconds, it's a sleeper. If you want to train someone, you must have scene changes at least six to eight per minute of video. Have you watched National Geographic? I don't think I have ever watched anything on National Geographic that I haven't gone to sleep in because their scenes are too long. You have to have scene changes. The narration within a video has to be 120 to 125, 30 words per minute. It can't be faster than that. It can't be slower. If it's slower, as in National Geographic, it's a sleeper. You, 125 is the pace for videos. If it's faster than that, the mind can't comprehend it. And the scenes have to change six to eight times per minute. Uh, a total of three minutes? Yes, because number one, here we, we keep forgetting we've got a lot of time. We're doing two-hour presentations. The people that are going to view this don't have that time. They have a hundred tapes to watch. Everybody's got photos to bring to them. If you've got a marketing deal, three minutes. If you can't say what you've got to say in 375 words, you're in trouble if you're talking about yourself. Uh, we did a, I did a marketing video for a company that was selling archers in a half shell. Quick frozen. It was an eight-minute presentation, and it, and it trained salesmen to sell archers in the half shell. And it was a training tool, eight minutes. Uh, how many of you watch orientation videos to get into plants and different things? They get, if they get over ten minutes long, ain't nobody in the room awake. So when you do your marketing and you do a video or, uh, or a letter, it has to be short, concise, and direct to the point. It has to be the point immediately. And if you're doing a video, you make your point, and then at the close, you hit every one of the points that you want to make again. And sometimes you do it a third time in the middle because the mind doesn't comprehend everything for everyone at the same speed. So you've got to repeat it. Okay? Any other questions? Otto, I've got one for you I'd appreciate some comment on. Oftentimes, and this goes to the, the point or the question of getting that second booking back for that organization or whatever. In our square dance environment, we grow up as square dance family. We grow up uh, everybody pitching in, doing things for the club. It's very much a everybody pitch in and do it kind of environment. If you hire a DJ for a party, that DJ is there to do the party. The DJ will come early, set up the sound equipment, and he or she will then uh, disappear into a back room at some point and change into a tuxedo, and they'll be there ready to go and do a very professional job, but they're a hired hand doing what they do, and they do not lend a helping hand to do anything else, even if someone needs a helping hand. At what point in doing parties for whether it be small groups or large groups, but more properly small groups, do we find a balance between the remoteness, the stand aloofness of a DJ versus what we've been accustomed to as a square dance caller pitching in to help when we see help is needed? For example, things like if they're setting up, if it's a family setting up for a family reunion and they need a little help doing something, are we the professional who stands aside like the DJ or do we pitch in and help? Uh, if we have been hired to do something, uh, do we volunteer to do other things like MC, etc.? Where do we draw the line between those two extremes? I don't. I personally don't draw the line. Uh, Hot Rod and I disagree about a time of arrival. Why are you leaving so early? Okay. I I try to arrive an hour and a half to an hour ahead of time. I will set up. What am I going to do for the next hour? 
If they're going to serve food, they're going to bring out the tables, they're going to do the different things, I will be involved in it. I will be helping. There's something about, I want to be a part of their group. That's all I'm to. I want them, there's nothing worse than not being loved. I'm going to tell you that. And I want to be loved. I want to be respected. But I think you, you command more respect when you're part of it. So that's what I do. Now, some might not do that. I put on music. I try. I have a difficult time at keeping the volume low because I like music. But I put on music. We did a, a deal for a Methodist church. It was a fundraiser for a uh, missionary black church. They were going to have an auction. They had a dinner, and they were going to have an auction. This cord to a mic doesn't let an auctioneer get very far. He can't do what I've been doing with you, walking up and down and across the room. And an auctioneer has to be able to do that, I think, to be amongst them. I lent him my wireless mic. When I got ready to leave, his wife gave us 150 extra dollars as I hire, as a reward, or as a thank you. They raised a lot of money for that church. I call for a, a electrical contracting company. And just like Greg has said about some of his corporate companies, its uh, customers, they had the moonwalk thing, they had a petting zoo, they had all these different things. My sound equipment became their announcing equipment. But the big thing that really changes the evening or the afternoon was when they set the table up and the bingo table started. You can't hardly hold a mic and call bingo. My wireless mic became the bingo caller. And if you don't have a wireless mic and you want to do one-nighters, you better go get you one. That's all I, I, without a wireless mic, you're tied to a stage, and I, I don't call from a stage. Yes. Both of you. Name it, name it where you're from, please. It's on. Boy, something wrong with this guy. <clears throat> Ron Kaepnick from New Jersey. Your sound equipment, you guys, do you use regular caller equipment? Specifically, do you use regular, like, uh, yak sacks, or you use different speakers I personally for my larger parties I broadcast in stereo I've got a floor amplifier 500 watt amplifier stereo amp I've got a DJ coffin box with a two channel mixer that I can hook up to eight inputs in I don't need that many I use use too many disc players and a variable speed CD player and I can have music loaded in all three of those by sliding the lever or turning the knobs I can switch from one to the other so I can have music going in uh, already queued up and going and then uh, fade over use the cross fader and fade over to that music uh, for my speakers I use two-way speakers and I'm trying to I know Hilton had two-way speakers for a while, and I, I honestly don't know if they still do. By two-way speakers, I mean a speaker cabinet that houses both a woofer and a horn. And I switched to those because, to me, the beauty of the sound of the music coming out is so mellow, so full, that that's what I want. And yes, you have to, you want to make sure you get something that provides the clarity uh, that is required, obviously, for voice commands. But I, at the time that I was looking for that kind of equipment, it was not available to the square dance caller. So I went to the DJ houses. Well, now Supreme Audio and I presume Palomino as well can probably order anything that you want. So they are certainly available through them. But that's the kind of equipment I use. It, where a lot of callers were going portable, they prided themselves on being able to walk into a square dance hall with an attache case 
and a column or mini column speaker and a small amplifier turntable, I went the other direction. I became pretty unportable. The boy, I got good quality sound. It takes me, if I'm unloading the equipment by myself, it takes me six trips from the car into the hall if I'm taking them two pieces at a time. I got that many handles of stuff I'm taking in or if I put it all on my, my two-wheel cart that I bought from Hilton at the last convention, then I can make it in fewer trips. But I didn't. I decided not to go for portability. I wanted to go for quality. And that's not to say you can't get quality from our manufacturers today, but at the time I was buying stuff, it was not available in the square dance market. For myself, I, uh, I sold a Hilton 300 and two yak stacks, four stands. I kept two stands. I had two... Nukem DP4s from the 19, early 1970s. And for those that don't know what they are, they are a ducted port three-way speaker. has two tweeters, a 6.5-inch mid-range, and a 12-inch woofer with a, a ducted port. You're going to see them tonight and hear them. I had them reconed last year in new, uh, new voice calls put in the woofer and the mid, in the mid-range. And you can crank those things about as hard as you want. They were 100 watts apiece. And when we talk about a 100-watt Hilton or a 200-watt Hilton, they're not true 200 watts. Yeah, but they're not even that. Uh, RMS is totally different from peak, okay? When these were around, we were driving them with 56 watt, uh, six, 56 watt Nukem amplifiers. And we used uh, six of them to sound the Sam Houston Coliseum to 200 squares. They really moved some air and they moved some sound. The difference is the kids that I'm calling to are used to the PVs and the electro voices that they have 415 inch woofers in one box stacked with four mid-range uh, speakers in the box above that and in a box full of tweeters. Four fifteens. And I'm talking about a church that has 500 teams at this camp and they're pushing this room and you don't hear the music. You feel the music. And I'm going to come in there with a yak stack. It's like I'm going to a five-alarm fire with a, with a handheld two-pound fire extinguisher. And that's the way I, I look at it. So if I go to the camp, like we're going to do, uh, we do uh, three camps the first week of, of June, I will take my speakers. But more than likely, they won't come out of the car because I will tie into their system. My 200 watt will tie in, or in some instances like we did in Florida last year, I did not. I took my amp out there, never plugged it in. I took my mini disc player and my wireless mic and plugged it in to their sound system because they had a 16 channel mixer and they had 500 watts and they had their speakers out there. So uh, I'm gonna let their speakers be out in the sand and the salt air. Okay? And in Oklahoma, all this sound equipment's up there. All I do is tell them, can you go ahead and shut down your equipment? I'm ready to hook up. And what I do is I bring in, I had a, a Hamhurst order me some cables. I have 14 gauge speaker cables. And I plug into the back of my 200 and I pop the cables out of their, their top two speakers that have a, uh, uh, a woofer and a, uh, and a tweeter in them, and those two speakers will handle that hall. So I use two speakers and I, I bring my own cords. I have yet to get banana cords, but or the, the double, I don't know if y'all have seen them, but the, the, the speakers are getting so big now and they're being driven with such power that they're using a double quarter phone plug. And I have arrived at a place where I couldn't plug that in because I didn't have anything that would work in there. But there's other things that are happening in the speakers. They're amped. 
you go up to them and there's a cord going to them, but they're powered. They have a 110 volt line going to them and they're coming off a mixer and each speaker is amped. It has its own 200 watt amplifier inside of it. So there's a lot of things that have changed in the sound deal. And when you're out, outside, that yak sack's not going to carry very far. And, and you won't have any bass coming out of it. And the kids are all used to bass, bass speakers. Just so I don't leave you with a misimpression also, the larger unit that I described to you, I may only use in one third of the parties that I do. For the smaller parties that are indoors, uh, my Hilton MA150 is more than adequate to handle it. And it has the added capability of, of being so extremely portable. If you're not familiar with the MA series, that's the one without the turntable. I no longer need a turntable because I haven't used records for years. I keep a, a Hilton at home for purposes of recording, a, a, a Hilton uh, Micro 75, so when I get records, I can record them onto mini disc. But I never carry a turntable with me to a party. Also, going towards your goals, I, I, I'm going to give you the mic in just a second, but I learned a lesson. Six years ago, five years ago, I went all the way out to Cloudcroft, New Mexico to call a dance. And 20 minutes into the dance, the dust was so great that I head crashed my mini disc player. I have 25 mini discs. Nothing worked. Nothing. No records, no nothing. Don't go and prepare to do a dance and not have insurance. I now carry two CD players, one mini disc player, and records. I didn't get hired to get there and not perform. Yeah, I have four microphones, two sets, backup speakers. <clears throat> I discovered a couple of years ago putting, using the monitor off my Hilton but I went down to Radio Shack and got a subwoofer from Radio Shack and had a friend of mine mounted in a wood case. It's a 15 inch subwoofer and they've got a voice coil in there. Put that on the monitor channel, don't put any voice through it, put it behind me and everybody in the room can feel it and it makes the sound so much fuller than the X. It's amazing. I think that one's still working. Oh, Randy Page, yes. Well, we I've just, got to tell you a story. Yeah, Otto and I were having a conversation earlier in this convention with Randy Page, and I'll, Randy I'll, Page. I'll relate that. Okay. I'm talking about marketing. Every dance counts. There's somebody there that can hire you. He gets a phone call. I don't forget. Is it the Booker family? No. Baker family. Uh, immaterial well, at this point. family. <laughs> we want you to do a dance for us. He says, well, I have a little difficult time. Have you heard this story? All right. Good. For those on tape that have never heard it, he says, I've got to dance tomorrow night. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it the night after that because this dance was going to be in Maine at their retreat. He says, that's all right. We'll send the jet to pick you up. He's been doing that dance every year. And if they can afford to send the jet, they pay you dearly. In fact, they would, they would be ashamed to pay you any less than dearly. <laughs> yeah, a significant tip as well. Yes, and not what, what, what will blow your mind, I'm telling you, there are people at your dance that can hire you. So treat every dance as a marketing opportunity. And I mean, also, as far as treating the people at your dance as a marketing opportunity, the people who are there to provide additional entertainment, like the bands, or maybe you got a photographer there, it never hurts to give those guys a pitch and to say, boy, we really appreciate having John Smith and the Sundowner Band out here tonight. Aren't they doing a great job, folks? And, and give them as much professional courtesy and promotion as you would anyone else, because they will remember that. And those things are important as well. I truly believe, I, I, I had in my heart that I was going to Washington for the George W. Bush inaugural, for the parties, because I had already called to the, for the family. I had called for, for George, 
for the economic summit and Margaret Thatcher and all of them and part of that entertainment that was at the Astrodome. So I just knew, and I had then called for the sons. I just knew I was going to Washington, and I didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Helen, Helen McConnell, uh, North Carolina. Um, in case anybody doesn't know it, there's a, a reunion magazine. Um, and they will send out, if you subscribe to the magazine, they'll send it, you out a packet of how to run a reunion. And it's military reunions and high school reunions and family reunions, and they give you all kinds of hints on how to do this. And they've got ads from everybody under the sun uh, in the magazine, and when you subscribe, you start getting things in the mail from, like, hotels wanting you to bring your reunion to that particular hotel. So that's another place, probably, where you can uh, get the party. I'll tell you another one. Every state's got a National Guard. I had an exhibition group. Garland's gone now. But I had an exhibition group. We get a call. We're going to do a National Guard Auxiliary uh, Convention or Reunion. They paid, took care of the rooms and all the meals for 17 couples in our travel to Waco, Texas. And they covered it. And then they gave us all the drink. Oh, uh, sorry about that. All our beverages for free for the whole weekend. So you never know where it's at. And who's in the auxiliary? Business people. So their marketing opportunities are out there. We just have to network, find the people that are important to us, that can help us. Uh, to When you go out to your square dance, you've got to learn who everyone works for. Would you like to have, talk to them. Do you have a human resources director at your company? How big is your company? Do you think that Home Depot doesn't know that I'm a square dance caller? I guarantee you. Does Bob Nardelli? I don't think Bob Nardelli does, but he's heard from Otto Waterman because I had marketing ideas about how we handle contractors, and I wrote Bob Nardelli with those ideas. I didn't write to anybody else. I went right to the top because when I sold videos, the only guy that could sign that check on a video was more than likely the chief financial officer or the president of the company because we were talking about $1,500 a minute. And you start tying up a company's time, somebody's got to take care of that. We were doing videos on board ships and everything else. The ship's going out to the Panama Canal, film crew on it. Somebody's got to sign off on that, and it's not the guy that's the purchasing agent. So you got to find all those people that you need to contact. One cautionary note about networking. Uh, your home club environment or the square dance clubs you call for in some cases may not be good networking and the reason being if they've been a club officer and they know what they've been paying square dance callers to come call for the club you mention what kind of a fee you want to do a party and they might fall over in a dead faint so we have sold ourselves so cheaply in the square dance community for so many decades that that one little bit of networking may not serve you well at all. I will tell you this, that I do not call any events that are called into the Houston Square and Round Dance Council. Hear what I said. Houston Square and Round Dance Council gets calls every day for exhibitions and callers. But their belief is that a caller should never get paid for those events. Their belief is that we should be promoting square dancing. And my belief is that if it's over 15 or 20 minutes, it's not promotion, it's entertainment. If we're doing two hours, then you hire a professional. And you do a professional job at doing a one-nighter. And their belief is totally different from mine. So I don't get any of those calls. Uh, Garland gets some of them. I, we also discussed comfort zones okay there was a caller in Houston who quit calling and I got into the Baptist churches because of him again networking we trusted each other's delivery 
We trusted each other's ability to entertain the non-dancing public. But I don't trust other callers. So you have to choose what you're doing very closely. And the reason I say that is I don't see them doing one-nighters. You know, you see where I'm coming from? If I'm going to recommend somebody, I have got to know what they do. And we came up in an era, Henry and I, where we worked camps together. We didn't work them together, but they were there the next week. Or I was there three weeks after him. And we had the feedback from the camp director. What did he do? Was it great? Oh, they loved him. We're booking him back next year. Well, then I have confidence. I'm going back to those three words. Confidence. And Greg and I both talked about that. Who do we recommend? So we look at some of these distant things. Uh, I would rather go to Florida and call that dance than recommend somebody I have never heard. I have no knowledge of, see? Or I would rather turn it down than put my name on it. And, come on, say something. I talked it. You won't recommend me now. <laughs> I, uh, I, I've been real passionate about this subject for 15 years. I felt I, I, was, I was not being heard about one night stands. Honest to God, I knew that Greg was doing a great job. I knew that there were other people that were doing great jobs. But I also felt that no one was hearing our, our cry that this was the future of square dancing. And that we needed to really look at it real hard because I also knew that what was happening in our market, in the Houston market, was we had callers that were absolutely ill-equipped to do a one-nighter. If they didn't teach 20 to 25 moves the first night of lessons, they could not call a singing call. They had to teach a square through and there was no way I was going to give that dance to someone that had to ride those people. And so I didn't recommend anyone. So I don't know how y'all feel about that. Did I touch a subject I shouldn't? I don't know. But you need to address your goals and what you want to do and where you want to get with your calling as it comes to one-nighters or dance parties and, uh, and handle it that way. Any further questions from the group tonight? We're getting close to a break time. I believe I said tonight, didn't I? I didn't mean to say tonight, but that's, that's okay. For purposes of the tape, that was the senior moment. Any further comments or questions? Okay, we appreciate you so much for coming to this session on how to get a party night. Hope that you were able to uh, get some informative bits out of it. And uh, enjoy the rest of your convention, and by all means, we hope you come to the dance tonight.